If you wish to pass information to a distant future, you wish it to be preserved. Uh, an example I often give is the Indus Valley civilization. But there isn't a single Rosetta Stone that enables us to translate that script into any more recent language. Imagine thriving cities humming with trade, homes filled with families and a bustling marketplace. Now in the blink of an eye, picture it all buried, not by volcanic ash like Pompeii, but by the sands of time. The Indus Valley Civilization, one of the world's oldest urban societies, harbored a flourishing culture along the banks of the Indus River. Then, mysteriously, they vanished, leaving behind enigmatic ruins and unanswered questions. Was their disappearance as sudden and calamitous as Pompeii's, or did a slower, more insidious fate seal their destiny? You might think archaeologists always know what they're looking for, but sometimes the most fascinating discoveries come from stumbling across the unexpected. That's the story of the Indus Valley Civilization. Back in the 1800s, explorers in India's northwest region noticed some mysterious ruins and old bricks around a place called Harappa. It didn't seem like a big deal at the time. They figured these were the remains of some relatively recent settlement. Imagine their surprise when the real age of the site was revealed. Decades went by with no major breakthroughs, but in the 1920s, a new director general took over India's archaeological efforts, Sir John Marshall. This guy was determined, and he kicked off organized excavations at those mysterious Harappa ruins. Surprise, surprise, this wasn't anything recent. Marshall and his team unearthed the first solid evidence of an entire unknown civilization and another massive city called Mohenjo-Daro. Think meticulously planned streets, buildings with indoor plumbing, and even a complex drainage system that modern-day city planners could probably learn from. The discoveries were mind-blowing. Think massive granaries suggesting organized food storage, public baths that would rival a modern water park, and workshops indicating specialized crafts within the civilization. And those seals, the ones with an unfamiliar script and animal figures etched onto them hinted at trade, record-keeping, and maybe even early forms of writing. The more they dug, the more it seemed the Indus Valley civilization was far more advanced than anyone imagined. As time went on, even bigger sites like Lothal popped up, showing us how widespread their influence was. With artifacts turning up that looked suspiciously similar to ones from Mesopotamia, it became clear the people here weren't isolated. They had trade networks stretching for miles. Fast forward to today and technology is making things even wilder. Using aerial photography and ground-penetrating radar, we can map out these cities with incredible detail. Scientists are even analyzing everything from pollen to teeth to piece together what the environment was like and how these ancient people farmed, moved goods, and maybe even how their diets changed. It's amazing what we can find hidden in the dirt. Imagine yourself walking the streets of an ancient city, but instead of chaotic jumbles of buildings, you see an organized world with wide avenues laid out in a perfect grid. That's what the Indus Valley people built in cities like Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, planned communities that predate most other civilizations by centuries. It's honestly impressive, especially when you realize they used standardized bricks, like ancient Legos making everything neat and uniform, plus those covered drains along the streets, a major upgrade from the open ditches you'd find in a lot of early cities, and proof that these folks cared about hygiene. The cities weren't just efficient, they also seem to have grasped the idea of zoning. Houses in their own area, administrative buildings looking important on a raised mound, and commercial zones bustling with activity. It's not so different from how we separate residential and business districts today. This organized approach likely made life easier for the inhabitants, allowing them to move easily through their cities. They may have even known a thing or two about building with the climate in mind. Archaeologists think streets and houses could have been oriented to catch breezes or make the most of sunlight, showing a surprising grasp of how to make their cities more livable. The Great Bath of Mohenjo-Daro is the ultimate symbol of their ingenuity. It was massive, built on that central mound like it was the most important place in the city, and the engineering behind it is mind-blowing. Each brick was precisely shaped, the walls and floor were waterproofed with some seriously sticky tar, and they had a whole system of pipes bringing in water and taking out the used stuff. Think of it like a mix between an ancient Olympic pool and a Roman-style public bath, a place where rituals and social gatherings may have blended together. It's amazing that this structure survived for so long, 
The Great Bath gives us a detailed peek into how they constructed things and how they managed to make their cities function in surprisingly modern ways. It begs the question, what other marvels from ancient times are out there, just waiting to be unearthed? The folks in cities like Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro built their storehouses with the big picture in mind. They knew a well-stocked granary meant a fed and happy city. Those raised platforms weren't just for show. They kept the grain safe from rats and dampness. Plus, they had these clever air vents throughout, almost like a primitive air conditioning system to keep everything fresh. It's honestly pretty genius, and definitely not how most other ancient societies were storing their food. The size of these granaries is seriously impressive. They weren't just stashing a few bushels for themselves. These cities were ready to manage a whole surplus of grain. That means organized farming, trade routes, and probably some solid record keeping to make it all work. We even have remnants of a sophisticated drainage and sanitation system right in the granary district. These people were meticulous planners. But let's talk about defense. Indus Valley cities had their own version of a fortress think raised areas called citadels, Maybe a bit like a medieval castle on a hill, these imposing structures likely served as a place where the important stuff, and important people, could retreat if times got rough. Then there were the massive city walls, which were meant to keep out both floods and any unwelcome visitors. The funny thing is though, there isn't much evidence of actual warfare in the Indus Valley. Makes you wonder if those walls were more for show, a kind of don't even think about messing with us statement. Now here's something truly mind-blowing. The dockyard at Lothal. It's like stepping back in time and seeing how seriously these people took seafaring. Imagine a bustling harbour scene. Ships coming in, cargo being moved, a whole network of trade happening right before your eyes. With this dock, they were connected to distant lands like Mesopotamia, trading not just stuff, but ideas and culture too. Think about how impressive this engineering is. They built a whole dock system to manage tides. Fired bricks created a sturdy structure. These weren't just lashing some boats together. They knew the water, planned for its movements, and built something that lasted thousands of years. Who knows how much we can learn from their successes, even when it comes to building our own modern ports and managing trade today. It's wild how two ancient cities, so far apart and with totally different fates, can still tell us so much about how people lived thousands of years ago. The thing that really sticks out when you compare Mohenjo-Daro and Pompeii, is how organized both were. Mohenjo-Daro had an almost modern-looking grid system, built with precision and focused on keeping things flowing smoothly. It's clear that they put a lot of thought into things like water management and hygiene, which wasn't always the case back then. Pompeii, on the other hand, still had organization, but with a bit more of that Roman flair. Their streets had a curve to them, leading the eye toward important places. It was more about making a statement while still being functional. The buildings themselves are another huge difference. Mohenjo-Daro was primarily brick, solid and practical, while Pompeii had that classic Roman mix of stone and concrete, embellished with all sorts of beautiful artwork. It makes you wonder who lived in these cities. Mohenjo-Daro is still kind of mysterious, almost like everyone was more or less on the same level. But with Pompeii, you can see the different social classes reflected in the houses, from the huge, colorful villas of the rich to the smaller homes and workshops of everyday Romans. You can't help but picture the hustle and bustle, the politicians in the forum, the customers in the shops, all frozen in time by the volcano. Mohenjo-Daro had art too, of course. Think seals with intricate carvings and pottery with all sorts of fascinating designs. But Pompeii takes it to the next level with colorful frescoes on the walls, mosaics in the floors, and statues everywhere, like walking through an ancient art gallery. Their endings couldn't be more different. Mohenjo-Daro kind of faded away, with historians still trying to figure out exactly why. Was it a shifting river? A drought? A trade route changing? Pompeii, well, we know what happened there, a catastrophic eruption that buried the city in ash, but also preserved it incredibly well. It's both tragic and strangely beautiful. In the end, they're both pieces of the giant, messy puzzle of human history. Mohenjo-Daro shows us a society that valued function and planning, while Pompeii is a burst of Roman culture and chaos. And the fact that we're still uncovering the secrets of both, that's what makes archaeology so fascinating. <laughs>